Thanks for listening to Exploring the Wine Glass podcast, the podcast for people who love wine. I'm Lori Budd, a UC Davis winemaking program and WSET Level 2 graduate. You can find Exploring the Wine Glass on all the socials as well as your favorite podcast catchers. If you haven't subscribed yet, now's the perfect time. I promise I'll never tell you what to drink, but I'll always share what's in my glass. Welcome to Exploring the Wine Glass. Today, I sit down with Daniel Brennan, owner and winemaker at Decibel Wines in New Zealand. He prides himself on producing wines using classic practices, minimal intervention, a community-based attitude. Combining the classic practices with modern in the vineyard and the winery, Daniel not only is inspired to make great wine, but to preserve our great planet. His fruit comes from Hawke's Bay and Martinborough, but it is beginning to make a name for himself right here in the United States. Today, he shares his story of how a Philly boy who grew up in the restaurant world went from a political and philosophy education to being a band manager and ultimately ending up halfway around the world making wine. While you are listening, if you could please rate and review and subscribe to the podcast so that exploring the wine glass is seen more in the iTunes algorithm. I would greatly appreciate it. Enjoy the conversation. Slancha. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Exploring the Wine Glass, sponsored by Dracina Wines. I'm your host, Lori a UC Davis winemaking and WSET Level 2 graduate. Today on Allure of the Poor, I am sitting down with Daniel Brennan of Decibel Wine. So uncork, unscrew, or savor a bottle of your favorite wine and enjoy the conversation. So, hey, Daniel, how are you doing? Hello, I'm cold. I'm in Chicago. You know, I would say I feel bad for you, but I'm in Jersey right now, and I think I might have you beat. It's Oh, yeah? 20 degrees here, and uh, we have a pretty big wind chill this time. But Well, I think the only reason why I feel like I got you beat is because I should be in New Zealand in the middle of summer right now, and I'm sitting here freezing. <laughs> I will, that I will give you. That I will give you. And uh, that is one of uh, the biggest reasons, actually, that I have yet to visit New Zealand is because the only time I can go is in your winter. And uh, I'm sorry. Still I'm just, gorgeous. It's Still gorgeous. gorgeous. But I don't want to be. I want to be there when it's summer, and yeah, I want to. Yeah. Y'all, I want to. I want to be outside enjoying everything, and I. I want to be there for like at least two weeks. So. At least. Uh, yeah. Three. Three? three. Yeah. All right. For sure. All right. You know. Once I'm retired, I can. I can do whatever I want. But uh, I also may hit you up at that point. Uh, you if for uh get some work out of me. I would love to. To do a hard sure. or something, and uh, we always like, like we always back. like some strong backs, you know. So <laughs> keen minds, you know. We put, we're happy to put you to work. Work, uh, you'll work for wine, right? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I do now, right? So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Um, so we met uh, at the Decibel Wine Dinner uh, at Kitchen Three Thirty, and. Uh, Honestly, the the wines were spectacular. Uh, okay. I had, in all honesty, I had never heard of Decibel wines beforehand, uh, and I am a fan. So you won me over very, very quickly with your wines. So. Oh, it's it's not a you know, I won't give myself too cre- too much credit on that because I think, um, why you know I, I, the only give credit I give myself is that I got a little bit lucky and moved into such a great wine region of Hawks Bay, and then I think we did the Martinborough Pinot that night as well. But that's actually why I moved to New Zealand. But it seems that the world's palate is sort of falling in line with that little more cool climate, uh, more acid-driven wines uh, at the right time. So uh, I think the whole audience, yeah, it was it's we. It's been received well, particularly in the last few years. Things are starting to build momentum. So, but not surprised you didn't hear about it before. You know, we're trying to make some noise now. You know. Yeah, it's uh, it's tough to get your name out there, and uh, you know, I think a lot of Americans drink American. You know, and so it's it 
it's a little difficult to get your name out there when you're, you know, however, how many miles is that? <laughs> it's far. It's the other side of the world. Just know that. It's as far as it could be, probably. Um, it is a very, very long flight. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, again, we're picking up some momentum, and I don't just mean decibel. I mean uh, some of these alternate regions of New Zealand are really picking up steam now because certainly Marlboro Sauvignon Blanc, uh, pave the way, and I don't think it's going to go anywhere, and it's always going to be that point of reference for people that, uh, you know, I had that moment in, you know, my 20s, I was like, oh my gosh, what is this stuff, and it was, uh, and you know it when you smell it, you know Marlboro Sauvignon Blanc, and it, it's like its own thing in the world of wine, uh, but uh, nowadays, uh, I think those other wines from Hawke's Bay and Central Otago, so they started coming in right after, but there was a pushback, because they were pretty expensive, and nobody could get their head around it. But it's been a, not a bad thing because in those sort of 10 or 15 years, the, the quality from these other regions has just gotten better and better and better, and we found ourselves a lot more in what we should be making and, and the kind of styles. We've probably all pulled back on things like too much new oak and things like that. So, um, yeah, for a lot of reasons, it seems like it's the right time for all these great other Appalachians and regions of, of New Zealand. Awesome. So let's get a little bit um, information about you. So you grew up actually in Philly, and your, right. parents, your parents owned a gastro pub. So you've been around food, and I'm guessing they had wine there, um, uh, at least beer, uh, at the place. So is this where you got your interest into the into the field? Yeah, you know, I joke around. It was a gastro pub before the term existed, you know. But uh, uh, it it had been a, a beer and shop bar as a kid, you know. Like you went in there at nine in the morning and it was packed. Uh, it was an old iron workers bar. And then in the early '90s, my father and mother bought it from my my dad's uncle. Uh, and they kind of expanded on the row home that was next to it. So it's basically two row homes. And it's the type of place that you'll see the same people there four or five nights a week. And it was definitely instrumental in developing my palate. And because of I was in proximity to, at the time, the wine school of Philadelphia was only like three blocks away. I was starting to do the WSET thing and really getting into wines. But even before that, I mean, I, honestly, since I was a teenager, I was always – probably grabbing bad wine, but I was always the guy grabbing, you know, bottles of wine and trying to go on a, a cheeky underage date somewhere in South Philadelphia at a BYO or something. So, um, and, you know, learn by uh, cutting my teeth sometimes literally with some horrendous wine. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, certainly the restaurant was the big step. And when I came back to it after working with the, I worked in the music industry for a bit in my early 20s after I finished university. And, that time in my sort of late 20s, early 30s, and I, I think I jumped at the right time. I left the U.S. when I was 31. Um, any later than that, maybe too risky. I, I know I've talked to a lot of friends, and also the age sort of limitations and, you know, with New Zealand visas and all that. So it, it kind of all worked out to be a good time to go, you know, start, a, I don't know, a second career or, or a, you know, another hopefully three quarters of my life, but, you know, who knows what my life expectancy is. <laughs> were, at any point, were you interested in the food aspect of it, or was it always the I wine? mean, I, I still cook all the time, but I don't want to – I never had any aspirations to be a chef, but I worked in the kitchen a lot. I worked, you know, mostly as a dishwasher, but occasionally on the cold side, and certainly, uh, you know, would have been accused of going into the kitchen after midnight and, you know, making something. I never worked saute, you know, that was the real, the, the chef's job, but always had my head in the kitchen window and talking to the chefs and always cooking on my own and experimenting. So yeah, I have a real, uh, real passion for food as well. And I like to experiment. The one thing that's been cool living in New Zealand is a lot more Asian dishes than I've ever worked with, a lot of different spices and things. So uh, I say work with, I'm just cooking at home, but you know, like uh, I, I, I like to be a little adventurous and I definitely, you know, we, have a lot of fresh food uh, in New Zealand, but particularly in Hawke's Bay. And, you know, we, my wife's from Italy, so we just cook all the time. She cooks, she's got her recipes, I've got mine, and we always cook a lot and cook fresh, you know. And uh, you went to college at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C., and it was for politics and philosophy. So 
that, that's a big difference. Uh, what was going through your mind of what your career was going to be with politics and philosophy? Well, you know, like most people, I came in basically undecided. I think I started business or something and immediately decided I didn't want to do that. And then I had uh, an open credit and I just took like an American government class or something that fit into the schedule. And I don't actually like the American part of it, like the, you know, the American government stuff and American politics wasn't as interesting to me as the international stuff. And anyway, I was hooked. And uh, I really liked the political philosophy part of it too, but I was like, philosophy minor, political philosophy major, like really no jobs are going to be available <laughs> for me. So, uh, but I kind of figured at a young age, I was like, I'm paying for this. I'm probably going to be in debt for a while with it. Uh, I know I could do other work and do jobs. And I, I couldn't really get my head around, like, I'm going to study something that I'm going to work in for the rest of my life. So I just figured I want to study something I was interested in. And, and it was lucky because then I got to go live in Belgium and work in the European Parliament and, uh, and, you know, so a lot of that stuff, believe it or not, nowadays has helped in the wine industry, you know, because I've lived, you know, I got to live in Europe. Uh, now we have a distributor in D.C. I get to have some experience there, I, you know, so it all it all worked out. And sometimes you need to be very philosophical in the wine industry, you know. Uh, I'll give you that. Especially, especially when payday comes around and you don't have any money left for yourself, you know. <laughs> Yes, I get, I get that. Um, so you mentioned about working in the in parliament. I, I don't know. That sounds pretty darn impressive to me. I, I mean, uh, it was no more than being like an intern and in, on the hill or something like that. Like, it, it, trust me, when I got the job and I was there and I like showed up, I was and and the responsibilities that were given to me, I was like, whoa, this is, I'm so lucky and I'm definitely not qualified, but you know, you, you just sort of fake it till you make it. And uh, I worked for a British parliament member. I mean, we were given the jobs as part of the, the studies, me and two other guys uh, who were doing the program uh, and they were more finance guys. I was, you know, way more into the uh, politics and the, and the history, European history and uh, this is pre-Euro as well, so all this stuff that's going on now with Brexit and, uh, I, you know, I hate to say it, but we were all asking the question back then as Americans, like, you guys sure you want to do it this way? <laughs> oh, see, they should have listened to the interns. <laughs> I guess, yeah. Well, no, but it was, you know, it was very evident at that time working for a British Parliament member who was a Labor Party member and was fairly liberal uh, that the UK had always kept it at arm's distance. They kind of had their position that we're not exactly part of this, but we are close players involved. They kind of had their own, you know, and they weren't going to do the euro. It was like never on the table. Why would they? They had the British pound. It was like the strongest currency in the world at the time. So, uh, but anyway, you know, you fast forward, I'm not as surprised probably as some other people. That's all. <laughs> now what happened that, made you say, uh-uh, politics and me, no, I'm going some, I'm going a different route. That job was a big part of it. Um, it was uh, really bureaucratic, really, um, you know, you can only imagine things are in seven or eight different languages and there's so much red tape you can't imagine. And uh, it wasn't as interesting as me, you know, on a, as a day-to-day -day job. And I continued to, like, Again, I loved like political philosophy and reading, you know, Nietzsche and Camus and all that stuff. But uh, as far as a day-to-day -day job, it's just, you know, I'm not going to wear a tie every day. That's not me, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so you left politics and you went to become a band manager. So, so far... <laughs> <laughs> Sounds crazy when you have to say it. Like like, you're not even on a spectrum because you're, you're over here, then woo, you're over there, and then you're over there. So, like... Band manager, cool job, not a cool job, like you know. A very cool job, very like fun. Awesome job. It was, it was almost the exact opposite of, uh, you know, those were great back to back to each other. But you know, I finished school and uh, worked for a little bit. But I was always helping these guys out. It was a guy I grew up with who moved to New York when we were kids, and then he put out a CD, and it was awesome. And all my friends got into it, and. Um, 
I threw, which, you know, this does translate to nowadays. Uh, we lived in a house in Washington, D.C., in northeast D.C., which was a pretty tough neighborhood, uh, and we threw a uh, 50, and this is not a fraternity or anything. It's just like some friends together. Um, there were no fraternities at the school. We, we threw a, uh, 50 kegs of beer we had in our backyard, and we had three live bands, and uh, the band, the you know, the band that was my friends, they were like, after we did it the second year in a row, they were like, why don't you just do this for your, as, for us all the time? And I was like, that sounds like a good idea. And I took a little time to think about it. And then, uh, yeah, in 2000, basically the beginning of spring of 2000, I think it was, I went, went on with them full time and, uh, and never looked back until they were a bit older than me. So they started having kids and, and uh, getting married and all that. That didn't necessarily uh, line up with the road anymore. Right. So, um, I went back to start working more at the restaurant, but it was a great experience. I mean, uh, so, you know, even now I was in Chicago, uh, I was in Atlanta last week, uh, was for a distributor meeting and I saw the, this place, oh my gosh, that's Smith's old bar. And it was, I'll never forget those stairs because it was these iron, black iron stairs that went up the back of the building. We had to carry all our gear up there. And I was like, oh, that's a nightmare gig. But, you know, it was like pretty good. It was, you know, it was fun, fun gig, but like the worst load in and load out of anything. But, uh, yeah, it's basically what I did from, you know, probably 22 to 27, 28 or something like that. And, uh, it was it was a ride, that's for sure. They were called mostly with the one band, Seeking Homer, but I helped out a couple bands in Philly and stuff too. Yeah, but they were out of the Bronx, so um, I spent a lot of time in in New York. Uh, yeah, they were. Yeah, rough. the the drummer was from a real rough neighborhood, and um, but they had two good-looking white boys up front singing, who went to Fordham and then kind of matched with the uh, two guys, you know, from the more neighborhood guys. And it was a really good dynamic they all had. And everybody's still friends. And it was good. Oh, but okay. They used to play the Wetlands in New York all the time. They had a live double disc from the Wetlands. That was like their, uh, oh. their sort of crowning achievement, in my opinion. You know? oh. I have uh, two friends that uh, – one, my next door neighbor who we joke, used, I used to play wiffle ball over our fence back and forth. Um, he started with the Misfits and is, and is part of Danzig. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Danzig's serious. Irivan. Um, Pretty happy. <laughs> So they all went to my, well, uh, Glenn Danzig and, and Yuri Vaughn went to my high school. They were, uh, he, Yuri Vaughn, it, it's like I had to get used to calling him that because that's not his name. Um, yeah. He uh, He's my brother's best friend growing up. You know, I mean, he lived next door to us. Um, and then Glenn was at our high school, too. And so we have that. And then, you know, um, the Misfits are all from our area. So that. Yeah, yeah. Classic band, yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, it's funny because every time, every time I hear, well, actually, they hate it. It's like you can't say mother to them. Yeah, yeah. Actually, hate the fact that that's all anybody ever wants to hear or talk about. Um, but every time I hear it, it just cracks me up that you know they're. That's my friend, you know. Yeah, I know it's hilarious. That was a big <laughs> hit too. Yeah, and then, um, and then in college. Uh, I had a very good friend that was a drummer, and he used to do all of those those types of uh, gigs where you're literally lugging everything up all over. But um, one club, we got to uh, meet Guns N' Roses. They were nice. there. So, like, I was sitting drinking with uh, Axel, you know? <laughs> so were they, were they, like, on their way up, or were they already? Yeah, they famous, weren't. Then? Nobody knew who they, nobody knew yeah, who they yeah. were yet. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard stories about Guns N' Roses on their way up that like they were just absolute fire. Like you know, everybody was like, "Who the hell are these guys?" You know, but they kind of sat around. You know, that album was out for like a year, year and a half before it broke. Um, yeah. For whatever reason, yeah. Yeah, because Axel. It, Axel, it um <laughs> it was popular when I was in college. I think my junior year was Welcome to the Jungle. Oh. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm old. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, but I agree. I think the music was already out there or the, the album was already out there, but whatever it was, it just took a while for to do it. But 
that was fun to sit there. Well, Lori, I got, I got to say, I didn't know we were going to be talking about Guns N' Roses and Danzig when uh, we started this podcast. <laughs> okay. I, I, told, I told Jay that it can go whatever direction it needs to go in. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, but that so that's that was a uh, that was some fun times. That was fun times. Um, but now I'm going to put you on the spot to uh, what is your favorite type of music? Um, I wish there was a word that I could try to just uh, describe it, but it's probably that sort of uh, mid-range. Uh, what's the word? I like to call it. You know, more of incendiary guitar. Probably those bands like. Peter Gabriel, The Police, U2, oh, that's kind of my real error, okay. my sweet spot, REM, that sort of sweet spot. You know, I, grunge was probably my age, but I don't identify quite as much, and I saw a lot of jam bands back in the day, but, the, you know, as far as music that I feel like was mine when I was, you know, like I hear an old Police song, and I'm like, yeah, that's my stuff, and I absolutely love Peter Gabriel. Um I at one time, you know, it was U2, but, you know, obviously they just keep going, putting out stuff. I don't even know. I'm lost in the shuffle, but they'll always have albums that I absolutely adore. Same with R.E.M. Um, but, yeah, that's that kind of sweet spot. And the band that I worked with kind of sounded like that. There was some bands like the Samples out of Colorado that I really loved. And that's pretty the sweet spot. You know, I have family history with, like, the Allman Brothers and all that kind of uh, more jazz rock type of stuff. But, yeah, that sweet spot for me and sort of coming of age, you know, you never, um, I don't think you can ever get past if you're a big music fan, the music that really hit you when you were coming of age, you know, sort of for me, it was like 10, 11 years old, all the way into my teenage years. Uh, even Jeff Buckley to an extent, you know, was around that time. Um, again, loved a lot of the grunge music and that kind of stuff when I was in high school, but the stuff that I really go back to and still listen to and still have like a lot of feeling with, uh, is, is that stuff. Yeah. So I don't know what, what, what do you call that? You know, sort of progressive, uh, progressive you know, rock? Pro, 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 yeah, it's definitely not prog rock. I'm not like into yes. And, uh, ELO no, okay. and yeah, that kind of stuff, that proggy more prog stuff. I mean, I don't mind it, but that's not my thing. Um, yeah, sort of, I don't know. What do we call that? I don't know. I did love the police. I have to I have to say that. Yeah, I, awesome. I had a Thank lot of police stuff up in the room and and that. Um, good looking guys too, right? <laughs> yeah, Sting wasn't too bad. Sting wasn't yeah. too bad. Um, you know, even Andy Summers, uh, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> see, I still can recall their names. Like yeah. they were Stuart, Stuart Copeland, yeah. Yep. Yeah, and they, they, you can go deep with, like, I had a, a young friend who's another winemaker, uh, this guy Bryce Edmonds, who makes some really good wines called Zaria. Uh, they're just sold domestically in New Zealand. He's a big music fan. We always talk about music. And I had, like, a deep track from the police come on, and he was like, who's this? And, you know, he's a bit younger than me, and I'm like, who do you think it is? I'm waiting to hear the voice. And he's like, is that Sting? And I'm like, yeah. And he never, he just knew kind of Sting. He didn't really, and he wow. knew the hits. And I was like, no, man, you got to go deep. These guys are serious, serious musicians. And, and he's like a huge police fan now, you know, way, way after the fact. He had no idea of all the amazing jazz and punk and reggae that they were doing. So, uh, no, they're really, they're great. Synchronicity, too, that whole, yeah. oh, yeah, mm -hmm. good stuff, good stuff. But uh, as much as I like the police, I'm really kind of, if I've got to classify myself, I'm kind of a metalhead. Yeah, I can tell. <laughs> yeah. Metallica owns a lot of my money. Oh. Uh, Messiah. Um, uh, look, well, you're you don't have to, the only person you don't have to, who knew who I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you don't have to do much, you know, connecting the dots. And I'm like, in a bar with Axl Rose, like, <laughs> what kind of bar was that? What kind of music was on in the bar? Like, I get it. Yeah, 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 yeah. good stuff. Good yeah. stuff. Awesome. <laughs> All right, so we'll we'll wrangle it back to wine because I really could talk okay. about music for a long time. Um, but so we before we started recording, we were talking about you traveling, and everybody who knows I'm bi coastal was like, "Oh my God, it must be so nice. You travel back and forth all the time." And I'm like, "Yes, until you're on the plane and mm. dealing with all of that stuff." Um, as much as it sounds amazing, like. It's not. So what what is the what do you like about traveling? Uh 
New Zealand to America is a long flight. So what do you like about it? What don't you like about it? Um, yeah, I mean, I miss my family. That's number one. And I get, uh, I don't know, I get a little, you know, you, of course you can get lonely. You know, I just, so I just try to stay as busy as I can. And like today I was in Chicago a day early, met up with an old friend, you know, we caught up for a little bit and just try to fill the time. A lot of times that can be pretty easy because you're, you know, there's so much other work to do and email and blah, blah, blah. And, and uh, um, so that, but that part I don't like, and I really like, you know, our life in New Zealand and we're very lucky and fortunate that uh, we live, you know, particularly my daughter gets to live this life where she can run around in vineyards and, and around our property and in town. It's very, New Zealand is very safe. It's very, you know, very nice place to live. And um, so I miss that and I miss our, our life like that and, you know, simple day to day. Um, but at the same time, I know you got to go out and nobody's going to sell your wine for you. You know, you got to get out, get out there and do it. So, um, and you know, the, uh, we did a lot of traveling over the years and, and I can, I have a gift of being able to sleep kind of anywhere, anytime. I'm a light sleeper generally, like I don't need to set an alarm to get up, but I also can crash on a plane if I need to or not off, um, you know, I take a nap in the afternoon. I, do, I meditate. That's unbelievably huge to, you know, I have to do it. It's something I didn't know I needed to do until uh, I started traveling a lot for work about four or five years ago. I was talking to a friend about it. And they were like, you know, I kind of, you don't think about it in your head, but kind of what you have is anxiety. <laughs> I was like, oh, really? Is that what that is? <laughs> you know, that, that, that thing is building up in there. So um, I'm not immune to it, and I know people can get uh, certainly more stressed out than I can. or temp You know, I don't necessarily have, like, a bad temper or anything, but I know people can get stressed out from travel. And that's, in the last probably three or four years, been probably the biggest difference is being able to, like, center, calm down, uh, if you have 20 minutes to just go away, go somewhere quiet and try to take care of yourself uh, the best you can. And then it can be really enjoyable and then you can, you know, get work done. You can be positive and, uh, and you, I don't know. I mean, maybe it'll run out someday, but I still walk into any wine shop and I'm happy to walk around for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes and just, Oh, that's interesting that these guys are selling and just kind of fill the hard drive with, what I see trends are and what's going on. And, and, uh, I know some people just aren't as interested and don't care or, you know, but I, you know, I could walk into a gas station wine shop and just walk around. I'm like, Oh, look at that. Look what they got there. You know? And I mean, it might be one minute in that place, but at least, uh, I, I, I luckily I still have a real driving curiosity. And, uh, and I think when you're this little tiny, tiny wine region and little, make a very little bit of wine, it's really humbling and educational to go out and travel. They say, you know, travel's a pacifying force. It's absolutely true. Like, I'm in Chicago. This place is amazing. It's gigantic, you know, and, and uh, nobody's ever heard of me here. So it's like, yeah, you better, you know, get off your stoop and, and get selling, you know. Okay. So how do we go from a Philly boy to New Zealand? Well, I started, I mentioned before, I was doing like WSET and doing these uh, like core courses this guy had at, at this wine school in Philadelphia. And there's been a couple other winemakers that have, there's a girl named Jenny Schultz who works out in California now. She's really getting to be a pretty well-known winemaker as well. And I think there's one other guy, but I don't know who he is. Uh, and, our, you know, our interest got peaked or my interest got peaked and then, I pulled him aside and I said, like, hey, man, like, I want to get out of the restaurant. I want to do this. How do I do this? And he was like, start studying chemistry, buddy. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I did. I just I had a buddy who was doing, like, his MCATs, and he was giving me his chem, uh, MCAT books and his chemistry books. And I was quietly going to this diner um, called Sabrina's around the corner from my family's restaurant. And, uh, you know, People kind of knew me in there because they know the bar or the restaurant or whatever, and they were like, they just couldn't figure out what I was doing with these giant books in there. Um, and I just started looking for schools, and right away Davis was like way too expensive and was just not an option. And I kind of, 
I never really drank a lot of California wine. It was only later in my 20s when I started having older friends who would come into the bar who had money, and they were like, <laughs> check check this out, check this out. You know, and I was like, oh, this stuff's really good. Um, so I didn't have, like, a big connection with California. Later on, I, you know, I went and did some vintages there and stuff. But um, I, I knew I wanted to go somewhere cool climbing. I knew I wanted to go somewhere up and coming. I couldn't go somewhere where you had to learn, you know, study chemistry in Spanish. I couldn't, uh, you know, uh, there's a there's a Japanese winemaker in New Zealand called Kasuda. He taught himself German and went to wine school in Germany. I was like, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I don't have the time or money to do that uh, or probably the brain, but I did study German a long time ago. But uh, so it kind of narrowed it down, and I had – uh, my last two choices were Walla Walla, Washington, uh, which is a really good school up there, and this school I found in Hawke's Bay because it was near, close enough to Martinborough. I literally just looked on the map, and I went, oh, never had a wine from Hawke's Bay before. Uh, I met one New Zealand guy who was, all he said to me was, oh, yeah, Hawke's Bay, best weather in the country, and I went, that's a positive. And I, so I went sight unseen, never tasted a wine, went by myself, you know, I had a little bit of money saved up, but not a lot. In fact, definitely not a lot by the end of the first year. Uh, thank God, you know, there was uh, the the New Zealand dollar crashed at the when the global financial crisis hit, and I got to I put all my money into New Zealand and paid the rest of my tuition. But it was really a leap of faith, and I really went all in. And uh, I definitely had some oh shit moments when I first got there. I don't know if I could say that on there, but uh, yep. <laughs> uh, I, I had moments like that, uh, a lot of them in the first six months, uh, and the first one was when I came, I flew into Auckland, and I took the bus down to Hawke's Bay, and you know, the scenery was pretty nice and all that, but when we pulled into to Napier, and I saw how really small it was, you know, this was the city that I thought I was moving to, and I just went, oh, okay, like, wow, my world just got really small, and um and then, you know, there was a lot of that. But then I liked the wines right away, so that was great. Like, I liked, uh, you know, the first weekend I was there, it was a big wine festival at all the wineries, and I, I was like, this Sauvignon Blanc is really different. And I thought right away I thought, oh, this would be good in America. And uh, and it just started building. That curiosity kind of came right away, thank God. And, you know, I don't know. I guess I was dumb enough to keep trying. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, and I met my mentor within like a month of being there. I kind of scoped out what winery I wanted to work at. And I uh, went to work for this winery called Tiawa, which at the time was privately owned, but now it's owned by Villa Maria, a bigger winery. Oh. And and um, so I was working. I purposely went to work there because they were my favorite wines in the region. And uh, when I started working there, the winemaker was out of town on a you know sales trip, kind of like I am now. And she came back. And I was working behind the bar at a, for a wedding, and she came back with all these bottles of wine. I was like, can I help you? Like, what are you doing behind my bar, you know? <laughs> like, I didn't say exactly like that, but she was like, no, I'm pretty good. Like, don't worry about it. And then uh, I'm the next day I went up to her. I was like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. You know, she's like, I had a feeling like you didn't know who the hell I was, you know. And uh, we're, like, really great friends to this day. And she's a huge influence and uh, still helps me with my wines. And she's an amazing person. Her name's Sandy Dobson. And just so giving and knowledgeable. And if it wasn't for certain people like that, like, I don't know what, what would have happened. But she was probably top of the list of somebody who just fed me and kept, you know, she saw how crazy passionate I was and nuts I was. And I was like, first of all, just being there in the first place. Right. Um, but uh, and she helped um you know, fuel the fire and always, you know, help me find work and things like that, you know. So, um, yeah, it was, it was a bit of a ride those first few years, you know. So how long were you in the wine industry before you took the next leap of faith to start your own label? One year. <laughs> Wow. Uh, but I mean, it wasn't, it, you know, people think like, oh, you just get started. And I try to explain this to friends now who, um, and I, you know, I like to think of myself as part of this group of friends and winemakers in Hawke's Bay, and there's some in Martinborough too. Like, we didn't come at it with a lot of money. We didn't come at it with, um, uh, like, we were chief winemaker for some giant winery and then split off on our own. We're working up from the very, very bottom of cellar hands and, and you know, starting with one little barrel and one little, 
and then slowly making more and more wines this year. And what I, I try to tell friends, like, yeah, I made some Sauvignon Blanc and Malbec, but I made, like, I think it was two barrels of Malbec in 2009 and 250 cases of Sauvignon Blanc. And, you know, it was a, it was all a punt, and luckily I knew some people in Philly, and by, it was probably about 2011 before the wines got there or anything, and it all came to fruition. So it wasn't really the first year. And the other thing that I have to remind some of my friends is, like, I didn't make any Sauvignon Blanc in 2010. I didn't make any in 2012. I didn't make any Malbec in 2012 or 13. Like, I had to skip vintages and, you know, run stock down. It wasn't like I just was all of a sudden up and running. It seems like that to people, uh, but it wasn't like that at all. And, you know, I have friends who get, like, frustrated because they're like, oh, man, I, you know, I had this fruit and I lost. And I'm like, man, it took me, like, 10 years to, like, have – enough reputation with these great growers to know they're going to get paid and I'm going to take this block and I've earned it. And I, I sat in line for two years waiting for this fruit. And, and so it's, uh, yeah, it wasn't one year. I mean, it was one year, but it was, I started making wine right away because I was in school and, you know, we got given fruit and stuff, but yeah, the next year I bought some fruit and I was like, well, let's just try it. You know, and that's uh... and I had a lot. And I had a lot of help. I had a lot of help. That's something that I try to explain to people. They're like, well, how come, you know, how come you're still here, like in Jersey? Like, how come you're not doing the wine full time? Because, you know, you can't just jump in and, you know, take, you know, you can't start making 10,000 cases when, no, you know, when nobody knows who you are. We're, we're thrilled. We started at like 100 cases and we're just at about 400 in four years. So, but having full-time jobs is what's paying for that because yes, exactly <laughs> I mean that's the other thing I was working for other people this up until only two years ago so it was 10 years you know it was basically okay. well it was nine years of working for other people and then I've only just split off a couple of years ago or right. three years ago so it takes it takes time and um you know it's yeah it, there's there's a lot of factors in there uh, and there's no perfect one way to do it. And especially you guys are trying to, you know, you're, you're trying to plant things now and it's just a long process, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I, I get it. You know? yeah. yeah. We're thrilled with that, you know, increase. People don't get it, but we're, we're thrilled. And, you know, like you said, those, those growers, they want their money and <laughs> it's a long, you know, you're you're not seeing any results for two years or two and a half years when you're starting, you know. And but uh, I honestly I, would have, I, I always well. joke around. Uh, you know, people go. You, you know, I, was like, I don't go on too many wine tours. You go to winery. I just went to Alta Adige, which was just amazing, and the mountains, the Dolomites, and all that. That was crazy. They had some really interesting things there. But even, like, the old – we went to this really old monastery that was making wine for a thousand years. There wasn't anything that they were doing in there that was crazy to me, you know, that was like, wow, look at that. It was just really cool and beautiful and old. But when I go to Method Production and Champagne – like, we went to uh, Berlucchi in Lombardia, of, like, four years ago, that blows me away because I'm like, wait a minute. Your cheapest wine is five years before you even can release it, you know? And I'm like, you guys need a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. It's crazy. And it's like French Accorda, you know, with how long they uh, – it's like when I started learning about French Accorda, I was like, oh, my God. Like, Yeah, how, that's where we were. Yeah. yeah. How, how does that – how does that – even play into your wallet, you know, at all. You know, I think I thought two years was bad, you know, yeah. and it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. Um, now you kind of mentioned a little bit about it. Uh, one of the things that we fell in love with in Paso when we first got there was the whole pay it forward concept in, in Paso. Winemakers help each other out. You know, we always can go to somebody and ask questions, and there's really no, I don't see any real competitiveness at all. Everybody seems to be willing to help us, and that's not exactly true in some other areas, no. um, but <laughs> but uh, it seems that it is that way in New Zealand. You guys seem to help each other out? Yeah, I think in most most wine regions, 
it is. I, I think, be, I, you know, I obviously can't speak, and there's, of course there's, there's assholes everywhere. Don't get me wrong. Um, but, but uh, you know, the, the vineyard manager who kind of came from, I think he came from Orchards, who works on the, the vineyard where I get my Malbec from, when he first started there, he's like, I've never seen anything like this where you guys, because I would just come and borrow equipment, and then I'd come and help out, do some other job. And he's like, it's really, really great to see. And um, it's why, uh, and, and I do think, you know, comp competi you know, there is some competition. It's, it's healthy competition, and there's literally competitions that you can have in your wine. But me and my friends, we're always competing and like, eh, check this one out. I made this one and this and that. But it's not like, you know, I don't think uh, if if that guy's selling more wine than you, it's not necessarily – it's probably your fault. You know what I mean? It's not right. anything they're squeezing you out of a market or something. And there's a lot of wine in the world, but there's always places to sell your wine and as long as you don't make too much. Um, but I think it's really hard for uh, – and why probably it hasn't gotten bigger, like, say, on the East Coast. I know climate and humidity and all that is tough, but – you might be able to find, and I know there sort of places like this in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, the perfect hillside where it's, you know, warm enough and the, you know, the moisture doesn't come and it doesn't get frosted and all that. You can grow, you know, a nice Merlot right there or something like that. But you need the critical mass of a wine region to really make great wine. And that's why, like, you know, some of my friends in Hawks Bay won't want to hear this, but... We don't make a lot of great Pinot in Hawks Bay. There's only a few people that do it. Maybe those sites could be good, but they really do it better south of us, not only because of the weather, but because it's the only red they grow, and they are just, you know, it's like, you know, you compound the learning because instead of two guys or one guy learning, at 10 or 12 or 15 or 20 are, and then they're like, what's they're doing over there? I tasted that. Oh, that Cooper's, yeah, they're awesome. I'm going to try them next year. And then, like, it just goes so much faster. Oh, what's that piece of equipment at? What are you doing in your vineyard? What's under the vine there? You know, oh, you leaf pluck on the sun side only and not the or morning side only. You know, all these things just, like, bam, they add up so much quicker. And I've seen it happen, like, you know, it, live in New Zealand in the last 10 years in Hawke's Bay. Uh, there's such a huge learning curve and things are happening so fast there because there's so many passionate, good producers, good growers, people selling wine all over the world with all different backgrounds. So they're bringing all these different things to the table. And, uh, I, yeah, I just think it's really hard to want to say, I'm going to try this on my own. You right. know, you could be, you could be a billionaire and your wine's probably going to stink. Because right. you, you don't, you know, you, if you, especially if you only taste your own wine all the time, you got to go out, taste your, you know, it's great, yes, of course, to go to other wine regions, but you got to taste your all your friends' wines. You got to, you know, you really got to get out and and make sure that that uh, you're not completely missing the point. We call it, you know, the seller palate. Right. You know, you're like, yeah, this stuff's pretty good. I got a really good friend, uh, and I don't know, you know, he probably won't listen to this, but <laughs> some some other friends might, and we'll know who I'm talking about. He must have a blank spot for like a little bit of VA and a little bit like tastes like his barrels aren't topped quite enough and he's drinking uh, out of them. And his wines are pretty good and the fruit's pretty good, but you're like, dude, you got you got your own cellar palate because you're drinking your own stuff too much. You know? Yeah, and that's exactly, I try to explain that to people. That's true. You know, you, you lose rec recognizing something is off. If that's all you're drinking, it's, you know, it's like uh, uh, going nose deaf. You know, you're sitting in, in a room that smells like bacon and it smells awesome to start off with. And then two minutes in, it doesn't smell like bacon anymore. You know, that's like winemakers who smoke, you know, I'm like, people say, oh, how can you be a winemaker and smoke? I'm like, well, their palate's just different. I don't smoke. I've been lucky. I never got addicted to cigarettes or anything, but they just have a different palate. They probably like a little bit stronger oak or maybe they like bigger tannin or whatever it is, but um, they're definitely part of the palate. That's for sure. <laughs> that, is, that is true. And now a word from our sponsor. Looking to be in the know about Dracaena wines? Want to know when we release our new wines? Find out about all of our accolades and get some behind-the-scenes information? Well, all you need to do is sign up for our newsletter. There is no commitment necessary, and I promise you we won't spam your mailbox with loads of messages. Need another reason to sign up? Quite possibly the best reason? 
you will immediately get a code for a special discount on all of our wines and be privy to newsletter-only specials. Let Dracaena Wines turn your moments into great memories. Sign up simply by heading to our website, dracaenawines.com, and fill out the pop-up or sidebar. It will take less than a minute of your time, but the rewards will last forever. Uh, so tell me, I, I, I'm going on a limb here. Decibel is because of your wine, ba- uh, because of your music background. That's where we came up with the name. There's uh, also my, my initials, Daniel Brennan, DB, Decibel. Uh, you know, like when they, so it was kind of part of the music thing. They were kind of, you know, they say, you know, like sound techs would be having these little sound meters, and you know, especially play outdoor gigs. It'd be like, can't be over 100 dBs, you know. And uh, and so I used to advance the shows with the sound techs, and these guys are like, talk about crossover. They were like chefs, you know. They were like just they could ruin your night completely if they were mad at you. So from the time we booked the gig, I was always trying to be nice to these guys, and just as a dumb little joke. I would put at the end of my emails, like, here's our stage plot, you know, we'll be there at 5 o'clock, blah, blah, blah. And then I put, you know, cheers, DB. I still put that in my emails now. And a buddy of mine, when I moved to New Zealand, he's like, you should put that on your label. And I was like, well, there's D. Bartolo and a few other, and there's DB Breweries, actually, a huge brewery who have known to have some horrendous litigation in, uh, in New Zealand. Uh, but decibel, I was like, I thought of that word, and I was like, that's a good word. It's a good, strong word, so I copyrighted it, and yeah, got a copyright now, so, and everywhere where we sell it, at least, you know. Right, and that's kind of uh, interesting in its own right, because it's tough to come up with a name for a winery that's not already taken, and with how many musicians, although I guess that's kind of more recent, all of the musicians who are deciding to become wineries also. Uh, but to have, and I don't mean that it's a common name or a common word, but decibel. Oh, I know. Is, I got, I've had a lot of buddies over the last, uh, you know, particularly five, six years. So they'll be like, I think I've got a good name for wine. I'm like, let's Google it. There's a winery in Timbuktu that's got one of those, that name. You sure you're not, you know, and, yeah. Um, do you really want to be competing against that in five years, you know, and, uh, but you're right. It's, and it's tough to come up with a name that you can identify. And sometimes even just your last name, you know, I had the easy decision. Brennan is my last name. There's a Brennan winery that's well established in central Otago. They make great Pinot Noir. I met the guy finally a few years ago and, uh, you know, so that was easy. I'm not going to call my wine Brennan wines. I didn't probably wouldn't like the names. And then I got really weird. I do that other label called Junta. I don't know. Did you taste that? That's no. named after my named after my grandmother. So I do a Malbec Nouveau and I do a Shannon in that range. And oh, I always want to. I did taste it and didn't realize it was a different label. I can't remember um, if the Malbec Nouveau was at that wine dinner. Yeah, it was. I believe it was. Yeah. So uh, that's under Junta, which again I got lucky. Uh, it's a weird spelling, so it's G I U N T A. So I don't think anybody would have purposely chosen that name for a wine. But then I just trademarked another name uh, for my reserve range called Testify. Nobody had it. Wow. And I got it in the U.S. and New Zealand and Australia and China and stuff. And like, I don't know. Nobody, nobody took it. And uh, you know, we got a few bunch of lawyers buying the wine now. You know. <laughs> There you go. Awesome. Awesome. Now, in the back of my head, there's there's a winery that has a blend that I thought was, but maybe I guess not. But I guess that maybe would be they a, do. Ha, but they, we got the trademark. Have, right. Right. That's awesome. Yeah, we had we had a lot of difficulty because we wanted we knew it wanted to be after our dog, uh, and the wine runner is known as a gray ghost. So we initially wanted Grey Ghost, and we were spelling it with an A, Grey with an A. And there's a Grey Ghost in Virginia, a Grey Ghost uh, winery in Virginia, and it's G-R-E-Y. And we thought that it would be okay because California versus Virginia, and ours is a dog, and his is about a spy from the Civil War. Um, so we thought it would be okay, but I reached out to him because we didn't want to do the branding and all of that, sure. and then be cut off. Due diligence. And, 
he was like, nope, nope, I'd come yeah. after you. Nope, nope, nope. So we did that. And then um, our dog was named after a constellation. And we were like, we are not doing no. anything <laughs> constellation, nothing. Stay away from that. <laughs> right. So so that's where Dracina came from is because Draco, uh, there's a tree. And it's called a Dracaena Draco, so that's where that's where it comes from. But it takes a lot to come up with a name. <laughs> yeah, to, to, to try to get one that nobody. I had a buddies in in New Zealand, and one guy they didn't know each other, like, but now they're friends actually. Uh, he had Element wines, and he called his wines Element, but never trademarked them. Then he kind of stopped making wines for a little bit because. He skipped a couple vintages, and then this other guy came in, like, right around the corner. And and it was only, like, a, barely a commercial venture. It was, like, you know, I was making, like, a couple barrels of wine. And uh, this guy and his wife, and they just independently thought about all the wines. They, you know, never heard of it because the wines weren't out in the market or anything. And uh, it was like, you should have trademarked that, man, you know? Like, if somebody that close walk, walk, can walk away with it, it's really tough. I've yeah. seen I, I've seen a big uh, Elephant Hill as a winery in Hawks Bay had to pull a bunch of wines off the shelf because again they tried to use Element series in the wines and they were like they were like you didn't do your due diligence in the region let alone the rest of the world <laughs> and they had to pull a bunch of shelf stuff so it could be yeah you might as well just check it out and call the people up because. Um, It'll save you a lot of money down the road. Yeah, because you know? it's a lot and, more money once you get going and have to recall everything than to just come up with something new. Yeah, and I learned a lot about uh, from our trademark attorney, which, you know, it is a tra called a trademark for a reason because <clears throat> you can own a trademark, but if you're not actually trading in the in the country that it's trademarked, you know, it's easy to for somebody else to make an argument and say, oh, I've been trading – since before they even had the trademark, and it, it can be, because uh, there's actually a decibel um, uh, champagne and I, or something, or a sparkling mm -hmm. wine, or it might be a cava or something, but it was only ever sold in Portugal for one year, <laughs> oh. and I think it's a champagne, and so they had the, I think their EU, I probably shouldn't even say this, but their EU uh, uh, expires or the copyright expires and they, you know, again, they're not trading in the market anymore. So, um, and that's why there's, there was this huge email that just went out to all New Zealand wine growers recently. There was a company in China that like took almost, uh, and thankfully decibels trademarked in China, but they took like, they went through every New Zealand brand and tried to trademark them and the New Zealand Patent Office and talked to the Chinese government. They kind of sorted out most of them, but I saw the list, and there's still some of my friends on there. It's down to, like, 20 now. Yeah, it's, that's it's scary stuff. Yeah, that's, that's what they're doing. That's what they're doing, and uh, they're doing it here in America, too. They're just buying, they're buying the trademarks, and you, there's really nothing you can do about it if you're, like you said, if you're not trading in China, there's not much you can, can do about it. Um, it's scary. China's, China's a little weird. Their works, their trademark office works a little different. I think it is like first to market and stuff too. So they actually had an argument because it was like this guy isn't or group or whatever doesn't actually have any of these wines. So they were easily able to wipe off a bunch of them and reject them. And I think China's trying to clean up their act. But, oh. hmm, well, that we'll would see. be nice. That would be nice. Yeah. Okay, so on your website you have. I have taken the spirit of my great grandfather Miguel Rodolicho and his Rodolico. Rodolico and his entire lineage with me. What do you mean by that? Well, first of all, I just found out something in December. I sat down with a bunch of my mom's cousins, and uh, I always assumed it was Miguel. This is my—I've never met my great grandfather because uh, that's what we call my grandfather, and we jokingly call my uncle Michael. Uh, but his name was actually Micheline, and I, I'm about to update and redo that whole section because there's a bunch of stuff I want to add to it. Um, and uh, so they, they, his name was uh, yeah Mich Michelino, but they called him Micheline. And uh, he was a Sicilian immigrant. And I, honest to God, I didn't find this out until I knew my grandfather made you know wine in the basement in South Philly and stuff. There's a lot of old Italians that do that still. But I had no idea that my great-grandfather, until I was in New Zealand, my mother told me, she goes, you know, your, your great-grandfather made wine. And I was like, really? He goes, yeah, and he was actually a cooper. 
too, like a real Cooper. He made his own barrels and everything. And I said, wow. really? I was like, wow, this is really cool. And like, so all of a sudden I uh, felt this connection to him. And, and it was pretty cool that, or at least I thought, it was really neat that I ended up doing this sort of independent of having known anything about that. It was like he moved, you know, he was a winemaker Cooper in Sicily. He immigrates to meet up with his brother who was a painter in, in Philadelphia. And then, uh, you know, gets this whole, his whole family and all the cousins and family, you know, that were really close on that, particularly on that side of the family. And um, I never meet him. I never hear about him making wine. I only hear about my grandfather making a little bit of wine like every other, but not making wine back in Sicily, not building his own barrels and everything. And so um, just recently, and there's a picture up on my Instagram probably from six months ago, I was uh, in Philadelphia in September and when I saw you and uh, they had cleaned out my grandfather's house and they found this old Cooper charmer uh, from Sicily. And so I took that back to New Zealand with me. I've got a really cool photo and people are like, you're going to use it to fix your barrel? I'm like, no, man, I don't want to break that thing, you know? So it's just kind of, I have it on my desk now and I hold it when I, you know, I'm really contemplating about uh, my next moves. There you but, go. Um, yeah, you're there's so meditating and being yeah. mindful. Well, hold on to that and it'll come Absolutely. to you. Absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I kind of, you know, I, I say like wine and, and you know, sense memory is like time travel. You know, everybody talks about, and music is that way too. Where you, They're probably the only two things that I really know of that are sort of not tangible, you know, that you can smell something or hear something and be, you know, teleported back to, your grandmother's kitchen or your first kiss or whatever it is. So that, there's a really cool connection there. But then there's this other connection where I'm like, oh, there's something in me, I guess, that I went down this route. I mean, nobody in Philadelphia, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania and my family are like even nearly close to into wine. I mean, now they kind of drug them along, you know, right, right. but, uh, but it's completely independent, you know, and the, the family restaurant is, way more of a beer bar than, you know, it's all in the microbreweries and they have a cool little wine list, but it's not something that's like, yeah, but I, I think, I don't know. I just feel this connection with, with McLean because somehow, you know, both do this. And when I first made wine the first year in New Zealand, it was, a, you know, and then again, this is before I knew about McLean. It was the weirdest feeling because I was like, oh, I'll, I don't know where I'll be the rest of my life, but I know I'll make wine every year for the rest of my life. Like uh, one way or another, I'll have some kind of ferment going. And, and even if it's a little tiny bit just for me, <laughs> I know I'll do this for, you know, and after all that travel and time and, you know, that it was like, well, at least I know I'm going to do this. You know? That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool that, that you didn't know the connection and it's there. So weird. Yeah. yeah. For those who believe in like supernatural stuff and, you know, it's. I, I don't know. I don't know. I think it could honestly, I think we don't, you know, I think it's more, it could, you know, I'm not saying exactly in my case, but it's, I think it's that stuff like that could be more scientific than we actually give it credit for. You know, the word instinct right. is, is thrown around like just, just a broad term. And it's like you're using this word instinct for a salmon that's going to swim all the way back upstream to lay eggs. It's like, how does it know to do that? You know, right. how do these birds know to fly south, you know, because it's in their DNA and, and because it's, it's built into their, into their, into their yeah. DNA and it's passed down through every lineage. If, you know, I trust me, I fight the birds off at my house all the time. You know, if they nest there, they're going to know to come back if they right. were born there to, to nest again. And so what is that? You know, that's instinct. Well, we don't know exactly, you know, there's some sort of DNA chain in there uh, that's, that's causing that. And, and I like to think that there's some sort of DNA chain from McLean into me that for whatever reason, uh, twisted again and me, you know, wanted me to do this. You know? I think that's awesome. I think it's totally cool. Okay. So I would love to hear about Gimlet uh, gravels. Oh because yeah, that is very unique to your wine growing region, and it's kind of cool. So, can you explain what that is? And it you have a Malbec that you've titled with that. So, what is 
gimlet gravels and how does it impact your Malbec? Well, it's a really cool story and I think that's why uh, I think it's on a lot of like the series for WSET stuff because first of all I joke around nothing like having alliteration you know they've done a great job marketing and branding it and I've come to understand it more now that I'm part of the association I've made some wines from it before but only joined the association uh, I think after 2014 and um, uh, it really is about this trademark that they have on putting giblet gravels on on your bottles, on your tasting notes, on your website, whatever it is, on your marketing materials. And it's because it's the only actual soil appellation that I know of in the world where it's literally defined by exactly where this river went. So not political boundaries or there's a mountain over here, so it just is everything from northeast, whatever it is. It's literally, <clears throat> there was a river there in 1862, and then there was an earthquake and a flood, and it took a shorter path to the ocean and it just left all rocks behind. So you can go online to their website, uh, which I think is giblicgravels.co.nz, and um, you can see the photos, and, you know, it, it's just all rocks. It's almost like hydroponic wine growing, but there is about seven meters deep still a river underground there, and we have a lot of aquifers. You know, I live uh, on the Appalachian next to it called the Bridge Pot Triangle, and that same river you know, is my drinking water at our, at our house or our drinking water. Um, but I think because of its definition and what it quickly became known as uh, a premium wine region and the story behind it, I mean, it was a tip. It was a, dra a drag strip because it was so flat. And they were going to quarry. There was already a quarry. There's still a quarry there. But there was, they were going to quarry the whole region. And these three viticulturists, mostly Alan Limmer from the old Stonecroft Vineyard, fought the council and Al, if Alan's just this, he's a doctor, he's a, I think he's a chemist and he's just one of these guys who's just relentless. He's just, no, no, we're going to, you know, you guys don't know what you're missing. And he kind of got a couple other guys with him and they fought the council for 10 years in litigation. And now, you know, it's the most expensive land in the country for, for vines. It's, it's all, and nobody puts their winery on it anymore. Like there's a couple little small ones, but you know, Villa Maria and, uh, you know, even uh, Oyster Bay, a couple of the big guys have vineyards there, but nobody puts, because of the land, you don't want to waste it by putting a winery there, you know. So and it's small enough uh, where that, you know, you can, you know, sort of surround it with, <laughs> with what you need, but it's just all vines. And you really can go up and you can see the different leaf colors when you're up above on the hill and see, you know, how different it is there. And uh, because the vines struggle a little bit, the the um, canopy structure is a little more open and so that you get that really strong UV and sunlight in there uh, and it creates for you know I think edgier wines of course stonier bonier wines and with the decibel of Gable Gravels Malbec I purposely use no new oak and I use a lot of large format barrels because I want to just show that and it's uh, and I haven't always done that but I've kind of come to that and it's about 2016 onwards probably uh, trying to use as much large format as I can because I want the wine to ju just be edgy or bony or stonier I always go to do like um, finding trials and I go no nah, just leave it the way it is let's let's keep it um, you know let's show that wet stone on the nose let's show that edgy bony, rocky tannin on the on the palate and that's another reason going back to Marlboro Sauvignon Blanc why entry level people love Marlboro Sauvignon Blancs because they can identify it and people like what they know. Well, you put that in front of a you know level four WSET in a blind tasting and they've tasted Gila Gravels before. They'll go, I know that nose, you know, I I know that palate. That's New World. It's got a bony, you know, it's got a certain aromatics. It's it's got to be Gila Gravels, you know, and 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 of course when it's Syrah and Cabernet Merlot blends and stuff like that, there's and you, you know you're not smelling gum tree, so it's not Australia, so <laughs> or eucalypts or whatever. Uh, so yeah, it's like a and and so they've had a great success. You know the high quality wines, high quality producers in there. That's helped a lot, obviously. But they've also done a really good job with that that sort of trademarked soil, if you will, and marketing that around the world. So they've done these great tastings in Hong Kong versus Bordeaux, and they've done it in London and. San Francisco and it's 
it's helped. And, and, but it's only like tip of the iceberg trying to get some of these wines into the U S you know, um, the Malbec's like a weird thing. I think I'm the only one doing a hundred percent Malbec imported into the U S let alone from the Giblet gravels. Most of the Giblet gravels wines are, you know, Cabernet, Merlot, Cab Franc, uh, blends or Syrah. And there's some, you know, Cabernet, I think from there is really special, real long growing season, uh, a little more Bordeaux esque, but still new world. Um, and then the Syrahs though are very, very like our own. The more we make the Syrahs, the more they just seem like they're Hawks Bay Syrahs. So, uh, yeah, it's cool, cool little wine region. So how difficult was it for you to get grapes from there? Again, strategically Malbec. So there's a lot of it around and, uh, um, yeah, there's a couple big producers that I bought from, uh, originally and, you'd be amazed at how and why it just has to do with like corporate and changing labels and yeah. Okay. Sell him some Malbec. Um, and now I work with an organic vineyard, uh, that I've been working with since 2014. Uh, originally I had Malbec from the bridge pa, which is what I make the nouveau out of now. But, uh, yeah, it's always, a, always a challenge, always a game. So I'm, uh, always up for negotiating and, you know, trying to plead my case for the, the guy who just wants to make, you know, a, a bit of Malbec on the side, you know? There you go. Yeah, it's, um, I've had a couple of wines. I, uh, you, you said Villa Maria makes one, right? Or a couple from? I, I really like Villa Maria uh, as a, you know, they're, I think the third biggest producer in the country, but I love them. They're a champion for organics. A lot of single vineyard wines. They champion a lot of different varietals and regions. They're big uh, pushers of Hawks Bay, so I can't say enough good things about a big company as I can about Villa Maria. Yeah, I think they're the first ones that I had that I was introduced to Gimlet Travels. That's yeah. the, and I've seen it a couple of different places, um, but it's it's not so common that I can see it on on a label uh, here. You'll um, see their Sauvignon Blanc around, but you know that's a, that's from Marlboro, you know. Right. But even their, like, entry-level stuff, I think it's just good wine. Like, there's nothing, you know, it's well-made. You know, I worked for a couple of their wineries back in the day, and they're a good outfit, you know. Yeah, I've I've been lucky enough to taste their wines on several occasions, and I've never been disappointed. I've never been disappointed. Um, and now I might be confusing, but didn't they just have a, a sparkling, too? Didn't they... They probably do, but they they have a uh, partnership with Domaine St. Michel, uh, and so they have oh. a distribution partnership with them, I think. So uh, okay. uh, they might – I know they do some bubbles, but I don't know that it comes into the U.S. But the other Giblet Gravels wines you can find in the U.S., Craggy Range, who are their oh, okay. you know, pre- premium Hawks Bay producer. They do great Giblet Gravel stuff. Trinity Hill you'll see around, um, and sort of spits and spatters of other – other stuff, uh, you know, if you taste it in Oyster Bay Merlot, they don't put Giblet Gravels on it. They're not a part of the association, but a lot of that fruit is from the Giblet Gravels. Uh, unfortunately, it's a bit like Coca-Cola, you know, it tastes the same every year. Um, but they're just a big, you know, corporate right. winery. Um, uh, a bit of, you might start to see some more of the Villa Maria brands like Tiawa and Esk Valley. Esk Valley is in the U.S. I think they're in the Midwest. It's pretty good. Uh, they make some Gillick Gravel stuff. Um, I used to bring in the Unison wines back in the day. They're, they're really good wines. Uh, Sacred Hill, they've been around, and people like that. So you can find them around. Craggy Range, you'll see in a lot of wine lists. And uh, give those guys, they're, they're, they make great wines. Yeah, that's um how many how many acres not specific because I don't expect anybody to actually know those uh, how many acres do you think are within the Gimlet Gravels area is it large is I, it I, no it's not very large it's I, I want to say it's like 600 hectares or something it's not no I'm gonna actually look it up because uh, it's not. That that's the other thing is it's been pretty defined and it's it's not very big, so that that helps. Um, it's sort of much much like the rest of New Zealand. It punches way above its its weight, you know. Right. Very cool. Very cool. Well, are you ready to play my little game of opposites? I could try. 
<laughs> hoping I'll get myself in trouble. No, no. Su super simple. I'm just going to give you two terms that are opposites of each other. And whichever one resonates with you more, you just answer. So there is okay. no right or wrong answer. And okay. As long as you're coming up with the terms and I, I don't say something uh, horrendous. You know, no, I'm giving, I'm giving you the terms. You're going to choose one or the other. Uh, okay, so we're going to start off with some non-wine terms and then we'll get into some wine terms. Okay. Night uh, or day? Night. Sunset or sunrise? Mm, sunset. Black or white? White. Walk or run? Walk. I can't run anymore. <laughs> Bad knees. <laughs> <laughs> food or drink oh man uh, well my email address is wine is food so I'm going to say food because that might encompass wine as well you know? there you go old world or new world um, ooh, that's a tough one I'm going to say I'm going to say new world sweet or dry dry bubbles or still Always go bubbles. You know, I never have enough champagne. You know. I agree with that. Oak or stainless? I'll go classic oak. You know, you get a lot of variability with oak. You know, especially after just being in Italy and seeing all those giant oak casks. I was so jealous. You know. Oh, uh, drink now or drink later. Drink now. <laughs> Blend Absolutely. or varietal? Uh, oh, that's a tough one. Um, I think blend, you know, when he, blend when he can, you know. Is that a term I just came up with? A phrase, blend know. when he can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, vintage or non-vintage? Vintage. Absolutely vintage, yeah. Cork or screw cap? Mm, professionally or personally? <laughs> That's a good. That's a good segue. What? So, which is which? Professionally. Well, unfortunately, in New Zealand, we've had a horrendous history of getting bad corks sent Cork. to us from 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 the other side of the world. It was a very easy decision, and again, wineries like Villa Maria uh, led the way with this. Um, uh, to go 100, you know, I think we're something like 90% screw cap now, and it suited our style of wines of being, you know, fresh fresher styles of wine um, and I get it I've had I had an awesome white blend that I absolutely loved in 2014 I worked so hard on that wine and I had like I don't even know 45 50 percent cork failure in one way or another with it oh. uh, some of them were TCA some of them were just slightly oxidated which is actually the worst because people just thought the wine was that yeah. wine yeah and, and and some were really oxidative and luckily I had my brother at the family restaurant who would you know I just I eventually pulled him off the market and he kind of ran them all through his restaurant with our distributor there and he must have he must have dumped a hundred bottles or something. Oh. It was crazy. It was gut wrenching because, and so after that I was like, what am I doing? I I got to go. You know, particularly at the price point I am and everything. Uh, I work for a winery called Paratua and still help them out in the U.S. In fact, I'll be selling their wines tomorrow. Um, you know, they have a fifty dollar range wine and they have a hundred and twenty dollar range wine. They can afford in that margin to spend a dollar fifty on a cork per wine, which and you know, they might get one with a hint of TCA out of every three hundred bottles or something, you know, what but you really gotta pay for cork um to to get certainly where we are. Uh, otherwise you go for composite cork and I just say go screw cap then, you know. It's I'm not a you know, I know there's some decent diam cork out there, but I haven't liked the way the wines performed under diam. So um yeah, screw cap. But personally, right. of course, you know, romantic cork. Pop open a bottle of wine, you know. Right. All right, Napa or Sonoma? Well, I worked in Napa, so I'll say Napa. Napa's fun. <laughs> Commercial or indigenous? Indigenous, yeah, yeah. Most of the stuff I'm doing is indigenous these days, or at least some form of it, yeah, mostly indigenous, yeah. Cool. Bordeaux or Rhone? Rhone, definitely a Rhone boy, no doubt about it. I, I, you know, I won't turn down a nice bottle of Bordeaux, but um, man, I'm way more into the, you know, uh, Grenache Syrah, 
type of stuff these days and have been on a good run of that for eight, nine years now, you know. Yeah, I think I'm more, uh, probably more Bordeaux, Capron, so Bordeaux, but sure. I won't turn down a, a Rhone. I <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, if I, I just if I had to pick, you know, and, right. and that, uh, that's, you know, but then again, you know, you, the problem is, is for a long time Bordeaux, there was to get a really good one, the pricing was really high, and it still kind of is that way. And yeah. now the pricing's starting to get into certainly it's gone through Burgundy, and now it's going up into into Rhone as well. So, yeah, get them while you can. But right. Rhone varietals, I'm a big fan of, you know. And my last one, I already know what your answer is. Warm climate or cool climate? Cool climate, yeah. Cool climate. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, so thank you very much for joining me and taking time out of your hectic travel uh, time. Well, I just saw what time it was. Yeah, we killed some time. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, I guess I'm lucky that you come to the United States so frequently because what time is it in New Zealand right now? Right now it is probably what, so what? two 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 fifty two fifty p.m. tomorrow. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. That's that's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. So, thank you for taking time uh, from your busy schedule to talk with me, and for people to be able to find you. Where can they find you on the socials and what your website and so anything else you want to tell us? Yeah, de decibelwines dot com. Uh, Decibel Dan on Twitter, Decibel Wines on Instagram, Decibel Wines on Facebook. Uh, we're on all those. I'm on LinkedIn and all that stuff as well, Daniel Brennan. And, yeah, just look for Decibel Wines. You'll, you'll find me. That's the okay. best way to start. Can they place orders on your website? Yeah, we ship to the U.S. direct, uh, though you have to order 12 or 15 bottles uh, to do the shipping. Uh, I think the the it is the price the shipping's included in the price so uh and then of course yeah new zealand australia as well and um yeah yeah instagram that's a good good spot to follow so we're always putting cool stuff up there and on your website can they is there a page on your website that tells them where they can find you in stores here that's a moving target. I've tried to do that in the past and always just seem to fall behind. So what we do list there is all our distributors so that if they go into a shop and they don't find it, they can say, hey, well, it says he's in, you know, Illinois is brand new for us, so it's not up there yet. But he's in Illinois. He's with uh, J.L. Gluntz, who's a, a you know, old, oh. old school distributor, you know. So yeah, that's a new one. That's so. Yeah, yeah. So they're um, – What's that, Paso? What's that? Yeah, the Gluntz family has a winery from Chicago, oh, yeah. a winery yep. in Paso. They just won Best of Show in for their port in uh, in, Pas in uh, the San Francisco Chronicle. Yeah, they seem to be a good outfit with, and I'm certainly yeah. organized. They're, they got me organized the next three days. So, yeah, we'll have that up, that type of stuff on the website. Our importer does a fantastic job of getting us out into a lot of different places now. So, yeah, it's uh, Exciting. And then, of course, I'm always, you know, you can always just ask me. There you, you go. Know, find Hit me him up on that. Instagram. Hit him up That's on right. Instagram. <laughs> Slide into those DMs, you know. There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. I hope uh, you uh, are either going to relax the rest of the night or, I don't know, go find a nice nice uh, bottle of wine. I'm sure. I'm going to find some dinner, I think, good. but, yeah, not going to be a late one. <laughs> Oh, all right. Well, thank you very much. Enjoy. Best of luck in selling here, you know, doing what you're doing in Chicago and Michigan and everywhere else you're traveling before heading home and safe right. travels. Thanks, Lori. I right, have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. This has been another episode of Exploring the Wine Glass. Thanks for listening. If you have suggestions on what topics you would like me to discuss, please reach out on social media. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as Exploring the Wine Glass. I'm also on LinkedIn as Lori Hoyt Budd. 
Of course, you can always email me at exploringthewineglass at gmail.com. If you enjoyed our podcast, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast catcher to help others find me more easily. Until next week, slancha.